Okay. Okay. So um, this is going to be the last lecture in the in the mini course. So unfortunately, the original last lecture wasn't recorded for some reason. So I'm just going to do it again. Uh, so thanks everyone who came to the original one, uh, and thanks Alex for being present here today. Um, so what I'll do today is um, I'll, I'll review a bit of the work by Hofer Vitotsky Tender of 1998, in which they construct sort of global surface of section and prove uh, sort of nice existing results of rape orbits for strictly convex hypersurfaces in R4. And then I will talk a bit about my own work with, uh, with Otto von Kurtfu, which is very recent uh, and sort of builds on this type of technique. So before I do that, let me just very briefly and quickly prove a proposition that I should have done last time and I didn't have time to. So, which is a very general sort of uh, statement. Is the following. So if, if you have PT, the rate flow of a contact form alpha, and we have P, a global hypersurface of section, for the dynamics of alpha, so remember, a global hypersurface of section is just some co-dimension one submanifold embedded in, 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 the, in the ambient manifold, which uh, intersects every orbit in the future and in the past. In particular, we have a, a return map. So we have a F, the point of return map, which is defined uh, on the interior of P to itself. Then, claim is that if we define omega to be the derivative of the contact form restricted to P, then well, this is uh, of course exact, where here lambda is just the restriction of alpha to P. And moreover, omega is symplectic. It's a symplectic form on the interior of P. And the return map F automatically preserves it. So it's a symplectomorphism. I.e. F is a symplectomorphism. So in other words, whenever you have a return map arising from a rape dynamical system adapted to, to some, and, and you're given a global hypersurface of section, then automatically F preserves the symplectic form and in particular the symplectic volume. So this is a sort of a high dimensional generalization of the fact that in, in dimension three, well, you always have return as preserving area. Right? So this is a bit uh, generalized statement along those lines. So the proof is very simple. It's actually direct from the fact that uh, the rate flow preserves alpha. So here, omega symplectic, since we're assuming that um, that the wave vector field is transverse to P. By definition of, of being a global hypersurface of section. So remember that the wave direction is precisely the kernel of, of the alpha. And by definition of F, F is just a C pro of X applied to X, where pro of X is just a minimum of the positive times such that the flow by the x lies again in the interior of p. This is just the definition of the return map. So if I differentiate this equation, what you will get is the differential of f, this is the differential of tau, which is a time function, um, times the, 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 the vector field generated in the flow, which is just the rate flow. F plus the derivative of P four. So this is just a chain rule. So in particular, if I pull back lambda, the primitive of, a, of the symplectic form by F, what I get is, well, by definition, this is alpha composed the F. Remember that lambda is just a restriction of alpha to P. And if I apply alpha to this equation, alpha with the rate vector field is one. Uh, so I just get d tau on the first summand. And then I just need to, uh, I obtain just a pullback under phi 
So if I do alpha from the second summon, and this is just because the ray flow preserves alpha, as we saw last time, this is just the derivative of tau plus alpha. I can just put lambda here. This by restriction. So if I differentiate the equation that I obtained, so this this is just the equation. This is just the fact that the pullback of the primitive differs from the primitive by an exact form. So if I differentiate, I just get that like the derivative. It's just I mean, this is a bit stronger, actually. The statement is that F is not only an asymplectomorphism, but it's an exact symplectomorphism. Okay, so the remark if the dimension of P is 2, so if P is a surface, then F is IRA preserved. And in some sense, this proof is uh, an incarnation of, of the Standard fact from Hamiltonian dynamics of so the, the, the Liouville uh, theorem. Where all, all I basically use is that the ray flow preserves alpha. And uh, well, you can see it as a version of the fact that the Hamiltonian flow preserves symplectic form in the case of a symplectic map. What was wrong in the not in interior? So, in the interior, the problem is that the ray direction becomes tangent to the boundary. So uh, in principle, you know, the alpha has a kernel at the boundary. So the direction is precisely the kernel of the alpha. Uh, so interior is a point, is a point that is trans where the ray flow, flow is transverse. Exactly. So at the boundary, the ray direction, the boundary by, by definition is, is invariant on the ray flow. Okay. okay, so this is just some sort of, let's say, digression from last time. So um, we'll move now on to uh, holomorphic curves and hyperbasal is in there. So this is a non perturbative approach. So where holomorphic curves appear. So here, remember that we're trying to study uh, the three body problem and perturbative situations are precisely the integrable ones when everything is more or less um, uh, understandable or approachable. So, the non perturbative situation is when my parameters are far away from the integrable situation. And, well, the purpose of holomorphic curves is precisely to allow us to say something about what happens in, in, in that situation. So, the fundamental work was done by Hoffer, Zotsky, and Zinder. It's 1998. So let me start with a definition. Definition is if you have a sigma hypersurface in R4, it's a closed hypersurface. Then we say that sigma is strictly convex. If the following condition holds, so if there exists a domain W inside R four, by domain I mean a co-dimension zero subset, and there exists a function p defined in R four taking values in the real numbers such that the first condition is that sigma is precisely the zero set of a function phi, and it's a regular zero set. So in other words, the differential of phi is non-vanishing along sigma. The second condition is that W is precisely those points in R4 where phi is um, non-positive, and we assume that it is bounded and contains the origin. And the third condition, which is more or less a crucial one, what gives uh, 
the name to the definition, which is convexity assumption, is that the Hessian of phi is a positive definite on sigma. Basically, what you should think is that we have a subset in R4 and its boundary is convex. So the picture is, is something like this. So we have some subset that is connected, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's say dog is connected. So the origin lies inside W, this is W, the boundary is precisely sigma, and well, the boundary is convex. So in particular, it is transverse to the radial direction in R4. So in other words, sigma is star-shaped. Does this mean W is convex too? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want, the wave is convex if its boundary is convex. Okay. So a particular sigma is star-shaped, uh, which means that it is contact type. I inherit a contact form alpha, which is just a restriction of the standard Liouville form in R4 restricted to sigma. So this is a contact form. So the point here is that uh, the strict convexity assumption is non-perturbative. So in principle, the perturbative situation is when uh, W is close to a ball, in, in which case sigma is, is just the round, the round S3 inside R4. So you know, if sigma is close. So I'm still confused. So is W convex in the sense that I know, which is two points in W, the line is always contained in W, between them is always contained in W? Uh, yeah. So, so like a, literally a star wouldn't work. Yeah, exactly. So if sigma is, is close to round S3, in which case W is just a round ball, this is sort of the perturbative case. So this is, because convexity is an open condition, this is strictly convex. So I mean, close, I mean, in, in, in the convex uh, work. So, um, but this notion in principle is non-perturbative, right? So you could have sort of strictly convex subsets in R4, which are not close to the rounds S3. So, the theorem that Hoffer, Vitsotsky, and Zender prove is the following. So the theorem is H of Z1998 is that a strictly convex hypersurface in R4 has either two or infinitely many closed rape orbits. Okay, 
Okay, so what's, what's the strategy here? So if you've been following this course, uh, you know, you will remember that Poincaré's approach to finding orbits in the three-body problem roughly could be reduced to two steps. So the first step was to find a global series of section, and the second step was trying to prove some fixed point theorem about the return map. And in this setup, the fixed point theorem is already given. It's precisely that by Franks proved six years before this in 1992. Uh, if you have a map from the two disk which preserves area, then it has um, one or infinitely many fixed uh, periodic, well, one or infinitely many uh, periodic points. And then if you count the orbit at the boundary, that gives you two or infinitely many ones. So the, in some sense, the fixed point theorem was already given. So the difficulty in the setup is to find the global surface of section. And that's, and that's where the holomorphic curve theory comes in. So the strategy is precisely use holomorphic curves. Find a disk like global source of section and then just hit it with the theorem proof before, well, combination of Brouwer's theorem and Frank's, usually called Frank's. Frank's theorem, so well you have you conclude the theorem. So what's the idea for the proof? And well, the idea is to consider holomorphic planes and the simplexation of, of sigma. So, so the idea is for So we consider the following symplectic manifold and omega, which is r times sigma with symplectic form, which is just the derivative of e to the t alpha, where t is the real coordinate, this is called the simplexation. Or if you want the symplectic cone or alpha. And the tangent space to M splits into two pieces. So Xi, which is a contact structure or the kernel of alpha and a trivial line bundle spanned by the r direction partial t and the rate vector field or alpha. So here, what you should think is that the simplexation is something like this. So here, the Liouville vector field, so this is an exact symplectic form, so the, the Liouville vector field is precisely the t direction. And as we saw at some point, the, the Liouville Lubel flow expands the symplectic volume. So the further up you go in the R direction, the, the larger and larger the symplectic volume becomes. So picture something like this. So here's sigma. And the T direction is possibly be transversed to sigma. Um, well, in other words, sigma is contact type in its own symplectization. So every contact manifold is contact type in some symplectic manifold, in this case, the simplexation. This is a bit of a trivial construction. But what we want to do is we want to study uh, holomorphic curves in, inside this space. So for that, we need to consider uh, almost complex structures, which are adapted to the geometry. So C, sorry. So C is a kernel of alpha. It's a, it's a contact structure on sigma, just a plane distribution. In this dimension here, so we have the plane at each tangent space. So R alpha, R alpha is a ray vector field. Alpha.
So I will call a cylindrical almost complex structure or adapted almost complex structure. Um, the following, uh, so cylindrical almost complex structure is a, a endomorphism of tangent bundle satisfying the following conditions. So first condition is that, well, it is a almost complex structure, which just means that it squares to minus the identity, or in other words, this is a, you should think of it as a complex multiplication by, by i at each tangent space or a 90 degree rotation if you want according to the orientation of, of the manifold M. The second condition is that it preserves C's and it maps the Liouville direction to the wave direction. So this line bundle becomes a complex line bundle for J and C is also invariant, so this splitting is J invariant. The third condition is that J should be R invariant. And here in the simplexation, we have the R coordinates, and we can always translate in the R direction. And what I'm asking is that J is invariant under the action of, the, of, of, of R. The fourth condition is that if I pair my contact form alpha with J in the following way, so this should be a J invariant metric on the contact distribution. So J is supposed to be compatible with the symplectic form given by D alpha restricted to C. So this is just a, giving me a Riemannian metric. So in other words, the complex structure is uh, very nicely adapted to the symplectic structure and it gives me back a Riemannian structure. So in other words, so the, the J is very nicely adapted to the the geometric situation. And for this particular class of almost complex structures, we will want to consider uh, holomorphic uh, curves inside the simplexation of sigma. That's a question. Yeah. So if, you, if you're, uh, you're uh, n, oh sorry, uh, um, your sigma is, uh, sigma is a three manifold? Sigma is? This is sigma. Sigma is three manifold. It's a copy of S3. With, with some contact form. If that's the boundary, uh, if that's like it comes from an honest holomorphic function on C square. Yeah. Does the usual co uh, complex structure satisfy all these things? Uh, no, but you can sort of deform it so that it looks yeah. like. Okay, oh, this is on the. Is yeah. on so if you want, it is yeah. the standard one is is cylindrical at infinity. Uh -huh. So well, you can always you can sort of change it a bit away from the unit disk if you want. Okay. Uh, to make it cylindrical. So the, the sort of this, you know, if you add the simplexation of sigma to the symplectic filling, and you see this holomorphic uh -huh. uh, ball. Yeah. Um, does it, such a J always exist? Yeah. Is it easy to see or? Yeah, it's not hard. You can write it down in, in a model. Yeah. Well, from, from the expression for it. Yeah, so, so if you want, the, the, the standard integrable J on C2 um, preserves C, but it's not exactly R invariant, but it, it is up to some factor. So you need to sort of change that factor and then you make it satisfy these conditions. Okay, so for this type of J, the J homomorphic plane, It's a map U defined on the on C with its standard integrable 
almost complex structure given by multiplication by i, taking values in the simplexation with this cylindrical j, satisfying satisfying the nonlinear cauchy riemann equation. G composed u is the u composed i. So, in other words, the map intertwines the uh, complex structures in the domain and in the dark. And this is called the cauchy riemann equation. Why is this point about the Cauchy curve? Okay, so the reason why it's called the Cauchy curve is well, if you remember your you know complex analysis course, sort of you can define a conformal map or a, you know holomorphic map from C to C just by the fact that its differential commutes with I. No, why do you call it a homomorphic plane and not a homomorphic curve? Ah, because it's a plane. It's a line. <laughs> well, yeah, anyway, it's, 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 it's a line if you're if you're an algebraic geometer, and it's a plane if you're not. Yeah. So it is a whole is this a holomorphic curve? Yeah, it's a zero holomorphic curve. Yeah. Anyway, so I was saying that it's good, it's good to remark that you know this is this is a generalization of a complex map from complex analysis, precisely because you're intertwining with the standard integral i. If you put here c i, uh, recovers the standard cauchy riemann equation. Anyway, so. Um, if you're given such a holomorphic plane, there's a, there's a notion of a Hofer energy. So the Hofer energy of U is, by definition, the supremum over a set of functions, which I'll define now. So supremum over phi taking over some subset P of the integral of over the plane of the pullback of u of some omega phi where where p it's just the set of diffeomorphisms from R to the open subset zero one with here phi the derivative is strictly positive and here omega phi is a is the derivative of d e to the phi t uh, alpha. So the point here is that uh, you know the symplectic form sort of becomes in some sense infinite at infinity so e to the t sort of goes up to infinity all i'm doing is just rescaling such that the integral of this is finite when i integrate over over certain holomorphic curves but in any case the point of this uh, of this definition is that well first of all uh, because of the choice of j in particular condition four um, one can easily check that the Hofer energy of a holomorphic plane is uh, non-negative. And in fact, it vanishes precisely when u is constant. This is with equality if and only if u is constant. And let me maybe sort of address again your, your claim, sort of your complaint is that J does not have to be integrable, right? So, sure. So, so it could be in my Gromovitan theory, people you say J is J holomorphic curve for this kind of object. Say that again? Whatever. It's yeah, there is a call. Yeah. Well, I'm confused about this. Uh, what is this e to the phi t? Can you, can you say that again? So, yeah. you know, the symplectic form, you know, omega is just e to the t times alpha. Yeah. All I'm doing is just I'm taking some diffeomorphism which sort of shrinks down R to oh, zero. Shrinking it, okay. Yeah. So that you know when I when I integrate over the plane, yeah. this is not always infinite. I mean, you have you have stupid examples of a, of a holomorphic curves, yeah. in which this becomes infinite, but you don't want that, so you do this. Um, so this might not. This might depend on phi, so you take this up. I see. Is is it is it clear that the sub is not it? Sometimes it will be infinite. Um, yeah. 
But the point is, when it's not, and I'll state it now, we'll see Ray Borbitz. So the proposition, and this was also known to Hofer before this work, this will in 93 at least, on his proof of the Weinstein conjecture for or over twisted contact manifolds in dimension three. So the point is that if the Hofer energy is finite, then asymptotically we'll see close ray borders. So if energy of U is finite, and we write U as a pair A, V in R time signal, where A is real value. Uh, we, if we assume that the U is non-constant, then there exists a sequence of real numbers going off to infinity, such that the limit over k of uh, u applied to the circle of radius r sub k. This converges to a reparameterization of Rayboy bit gamma, where here um, t is just the integral of v with respect to alpha, and this is positive and finite, and, and gamma is a closed rate boy bit. And let me sort of, what is RK? RK is a sequence of real numbers. So you just, you just, uh, Applying the plane, maybe I'll draw a picture, but like you're just applying the, the map to the circle of radius RK and, and C. Can you draw the surface edge plane? Hmm? Are you going to draw something? Yeah, I'm going to draw a picture. Yeah. All, all that I'm saying is that if you have finite energy, then this holomorphic plane becomes asymptotic at infinity to a closed ray board. Let me just, before I, before I say that, so there's also under some non degeneracy assumption on gamma. Then, in fact, the limit sort of the same is true for every R. And this limit is uniform and exponential. It's just some technical remark, but, but, anyways, so what you should think is that I have the simplexation here sphere sigma, and I have a holomorphic plane, and I have gamma sort of sitting at infinity, and this guy is asymptotic to gamma at infinity. So here's you know, zero if you want, and C this is a copy of C. And I'm just looking at the sequence of radii that goes up to infinity, this R case, and what I see in the limit is precisely this close ray orbit kind. Do you, uh, for this proposition, do you require, do you require you, the, the homomorphic plane U to be, to have any condition of infinity or does, does it come from here? It comes from finite energy. It comes from finite energy. Yeah. So that, this is the whole point of this sort of quantity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see, so it's saying that if, if it is finite energy, in fact, it has to be asymptotic to a rate orbit. Yeah. yeah. It's a conclusion. It's quite strong. It's just like this is precisely how Hofer proved the Weinstein which is how he found a ray board bit at the end of the day, just by constructing some finite energy planes. And you know, let me also remark: if you have planes which are not finite energies, their asymptotics could be very wild. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and this is sort of sub subject of ongoing 
work, you know, with Hofer and Fish, and using this sort of feral home of the curse. And, you know, you can get all sorts of crazy things at infinity if you don't assume finite energy in this sense. How should I think of big T? Of the T in, the, in that equation? Yeah, the one that's less than infinity. Ah, it's just the T is the is the period of gamma. Okay. This is the, I see. Okay. Yeah. So here, this little T runs between uh, zero and one. Mm -hmm. But in the theorem, it could be the gamma is just that sitting at a point. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, the the ray vector field is nowhere vanishing. Nowhere vanishing. So what is it? Non degenerate thing. Non degeneracy is in the sort of in calculus variation sense, if you want. Or it's just like the, um, you look at the linearized rate flow yeah. restricted to the contact structure, which is transverse to gamma. Mm -hmm. So if you look how it comes back, and you want to ask that uh, the sort of this linearization, this is a, this is a symplectic, symplectic matrix. Yeah. It doesn't have one in its spectrum. So, you know, in particular, gamma is isolated. Oh, I see, I see, I see. This, could, this also works in some of the more generalized. So it's, like uh, it's like gamma's like perturbatively isolated. Uh, yeah. Okay. If I perturb my contact form. No, sorry, I mean, like, um, I mean, doesn't so like linear order in perturbation theory. Linear order perturb. Uh, yeah, you're just looking at the linear matrix, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so. What do I want to do? So remember, we're trying to find the global surface of section and then apply fixed points here. So in order to find the global surface of section, well, we want to find a homomorphic open book. on S3, well, on sigma, which is a copy of S3. And remember, we've seen that S3 has a trivial open book with a page, which is a disk, and no monitoring. And what is holomorphic open book mean? Well, it's an open book, but it's in some sense sort of compatible with the given uh, contact form alpha. So, i.e., the pages The pages uh, are projections to sigma. Of finite energy planes in the simplexation. And well, the open book is also adapted to the dynamics. Adapted to the rate dynamics. Okay, so remember, this just means that the boundary, the, the binding of the open book, when in this case will be a circle, is uh, is a ray orbit. It's going to be precisely the asymptotic gamma of the finite energy plane, and the rate dynamics is transverse to the interior of each page. picture to have in mind is the following. So the picture is, so here's sigma, and here's the r direction, and here's the binding of the open book, which is going to be an orbit gamma, and so here's the uh, r times the binding. So here's the r direction. So what you think is, is that we have like a foliation of the symplectization by copies of C, which are your finite energy planes. And then they project down to sigma to the page of the open book P, which is just a copy of D2, whose boundary is precisely gamma. So the plane is asymptotic at infinity to gamma, where I project it down, I get a two disk whose boundary is gamma, and this is supposed to be 
the pages of the open book in Sigma. And we, and we want them to be adapted to the given dynamical system. So here, this is a slightly sort of algebraic geometry type picture. Yeah, it's not, it's not yeah. One P for each, each, each one of these planes. Yes. And you know, yeah, different. Yeah, so because, because I'm assuming that J is R invariant. If I R, tra R translate, if I have a homomorphic plane, I have another one. So on top of each projection, I have like a R worth, an R family worth of planes. Oh, I see. And so, then, I see. so you don't. Have, okay. And then I have a, the point is I will have a circle family of, of, of planes after I project down. So the picture is like on S3. Oh, I'm so confused. You, you drew three, three planes, three disks in R cross B. We have like a, no, 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 the three you drew, do they project to different disks in sigma? To the same disk. The same disk in sigma. But in fact, you have an S1 worth of these families. Exactly. So it's like a S1 cross R. Yes. Family of this. So when I quotient out by the R action, I have a circle family. Yeah, OK. Disks. Yeah. So to the end of the day, you want to prove that the moduli space of such planes is R times S1. And then when I sort of cut down the R action, I have an S1 family of pages. And the picture that I was going to draw is like, so here's the binding, you know, gamma. I need to think this is a circle going like this. And so here's a, here's a neighborhood of, of gamma. And so the pages look like all their disks. Like the trivial open book on S3. So this is a two disk whose boundary is precisely gamma. And well, they're supposed to be transfers to the given ring, like it will sort of flow, it's like know, something like this. Yeah. And that's, you know, it comes back and, and that's something. So we have a return map on each page. This is what's usually called a finite energy foliation. So, so the picture is different in, in this new one you drew. You also drew three on the top, three on the bottom. They're not the same three you drew before. Okay. On top of each one of these new ones, there's an R family of the open. Is this true? In top, on top of each of these two disks, there's an R family of R planes. Family. Which is one, one you drew one so of It's only one of the ones that I drew. So it's not like those three are those two pieces, it's different. No, no. So this is this is a projected picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is usually what's called a finite energy foliation mm -hmm. by Hofer and, and people. This is the kind of thing that I can only make sense of it in a symplectization, or I can make sense of it in any symplectic manifold my contact being lives in. You can also make sense. I mean, if you have a like, if it's like a, you know a closed sphere bundle or something. Closed. A closed sphere bundle. Like, a closed sphere bundle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you look at the. You, know, you can attach the cylindrical end. So you get a copy of simplexation, but the closed sphere bundle also has a filling. Yeah, it has a filling. So you can just look at homomorphic curves in the whole thing. You could look at that too. Yeah. Anyway, so so what, what would I need to actually achieve such a program? Well, first of all, I need a bunch of things. So, you know, the first condition is that the binding of the open book, which is my orbit gamma, should be linked to every other ray orbit. Every other orbit. Now, if, if I want if I want my original sort of dynamical system to be transverse to each of the pages, then well, gamma, the, you know, the linking number of gamma with every other page is the intersection of the of the orbit with the page, so it has to be at least uh, at least one. And well, it has to be unknotted as well. Right? This means that it bounds a disk. Also, I mean, this is a bit of a sort of a technical digression, but like 
usually what you would like to have is that you know, gamma is not degenerate. And this has to do with the exponential sort of conversions of holomorphic planes, as I mentioned here. And you would also like it to have minimal period for a reason which is a bit sort of mysterious at the moment, but it has to do with the compactness of the moduli spaces of holomorphic planes. And you would also like it to have uh, what's called a, well, the, you, want, you would also like to have the, the Colley-Zender index of gamma is three. This is the Colley-Zender index. Which I haven't defined for you and I won't, but um, Colley-Zender index is some sort of winding number attached to every closed ray boy bit. Um, I mean, it, in principle, it depends on some trivialization, but it turns out that in the case of S3, because there's no pi 2, it does not depend on any choices. Um, and well, the fact that I want it to be 3 has to do with the dimension of the moduli space. Of moduli space of planes. This hopefully will make a bit more sense in a moment. But so is this, uh, I don't know, what's this, is this a statement? Is always true that the Collins Ender index is three? No, no, it's not. I mean, I would like it. I would like it to be like this because then I will look at the moduli space of planes, and this will come in in the, in the sort of the expected dimension. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the point is like, well, you, if you assume that you have such a thing, then you do some analysis and you get your sort of adapted open book. Mm -hmm. And then how would you obtain such a gamma? Well, you can do a bit more work. I see. But is this a, con a consequence of my, uh, like of this theorem? Uh, no, I mean, it's not. I mean, you need to start with such a gamma. So. Okay. I mean, let, let, me, let me just, let me, let me say how the logic would go. Okay, yeah. so, so basically you assume first that there exists such a gamma. Assume there exists gamma as well. So, well, what you do is you consider the moduli spaces of whole holomorphic uh, planes, which are asymptotic to gamma at infinity. Consider moduli space M of finite energy planes. Asymptotic to gamma, and here you do it modulo R translations, modulo the R action. So I quotient already by the R action because J's are invariant. If you give me a plane, I can translate and have another plane. I just want to not consider that, so I just divide by that action, and I also divide by the action of reparameterizations of conformal maps in the domain. So reparameterizations by conformal maps. On, on the domain C. So what is the expected dimension of this moduli space? So the expected dimension is, well, what the dimension would be if M happened to be a manifold. Right? But there's a formula for that. So it's usually called the virtual dimension or expected dimension, which is given in terms of the Collins-Ender index. So the 
condescending index of gamma minus two, and after I've done all this sort of, uh, after I quotient, quotiented out all the symmetries in the problem, precisely the R action and the reparametrization. So this is the formula that I would get because I'm assuming that this is three, this is precisely one. So this is where you see the assumption on the condescending index. So here I'm using the riemann roth formula. In this in this setting, right? Um, which in general is a bit more complicated. So as I said, this is what the dimension of M would be if it were a manifold. So the whole point of the proof is precisely to show that M is at the end of the day a manifold, and because it's one dimensional, uh, if it's also non empty and so on and compact, it will be a circle. And that's precisely the circle parametrizing the pages of the open book. So how would you prove such a thing? So now the whole work is trying to understand what the structure of M is. So let me sort of give you a bunch of black boxes. So first of all, there's a phenomenon called automatic transversality. which is uh, basically a four-dimensional situation, right? So here we have complexation is four-dimensional. So there's a very magical phenomenon which uh, allows me to say that M is actually a manifold. Only in the case when virtual dimension is one? Always. Uh, always. Well, uh, always under some assumptions on the on the index and on on the normal um, uh, on the normal first turn number. I mean, there's there's some inequality here that you need to check, which is numerical, and it turns out that in this case it's satisfied, and but it's very easy to check. Um, and the automatic transversality magic tells me that, well, automatically M is going to be transversely cut out. Cut out. So it's, it's manifold, but this is sort of a purely four-dimensional phenomenon. My stupid question is like, why do you want virtual dimension to be one and not like? Uh... What if the virtual dimension is two? If I have like a compact two manifold, it's not a, you know, I can always find a circle instead of it. That's all. Wow. I don't know how to answer that question, but like. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I, well, I mean, the question, my question is, is, is mu equals, is the index equals three? Do you want it actually equals three or do you want it any, like anything above three and above? Okay, that's a good question. So I'll get to that. But uh, strict convexity in this case implies that Collisander index is always at least three. This is what's called dynamical convexity. Okay. Um, There's always three or more. Yeah. And in, 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 whenever you have convexity. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is one of the sort of basic inputs for, for trying to understand what M is. So another basic input is called positivity of intersections. And here there's also another sort of ingredient which I'll just say it's asymptotic analysis. And here, uh, more specifically, C frame intersection theory. So here, positivity of intersections is also, this is in dimension four again. Positivity of inter intersections is a, is a statement that whenever you give me two holomorphic planes, well, they will, if I intersect them, if I consider their, their, their intersections and I count them with signs, they will always contribute positively. Like in sort of, a, in when you're doing, uh, you know, complex maps and so on, sort of intersections usually come with positive signs. The problem here is that holomorphic planes have boundary, right? The boundary shoots off to infinity. So in principle, uh, 
there's not a well-defined way to count these intersections because they might escape to infinity, right? So, you know, the, the classical sort of Milner argument to define a notion of uh, intersecting two maps is not really working. In principle, it might not give you a homotopy invariant way of counting intersections. So this is solved by uh, suitable asymptotic analysis and uh, the ciphering notion of counting intersection because of the very specific way a holomorphic plane can approach a ray orbit at infinity. Uh, this was known by Hoffer, Vitsotsky, Sender, and, and, and you know, people like that. Um, you can actually use the structure at infinity to cook up an invariant, a homotopy invariant way of counting intersections between homomorphic planes. Um, so this was done by Sif. This was even done after Hoffer, Vitsotsky, Sender proved this theorem but it was sort of more or less already present in their proof. Mm -hmm. uh, so Stephen was a PhD student of Hofer. So he did this after um, these this people proved this theorem. But so this two uh, sort of basic and, and important and four-dimensional um, you know, uh, conditions will imply that M is at least locally a foliation. What you end up doing is that you have a homotopy invariant way of intersecting planes yeah. and you compute that the Seifert intersection is zero. So what will happen is that when you project holomorphic planes to the manifold, mm -hmm. they will not intersect each other. Right. Okay, so what does what N be a local foliation mean? So it means that through every point um, on sigma. Oh, in relation to sigma, M is a space, but it doesn't map to sigma. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, every each element point, in each point gives a every element in M is a, is a is a map to the simplexation. Mm -hmm. I project it down to sigma, and I'm saying that what I obtain after I've done that, yeah. that I can think of each element in M mm -hmm. as a leaf of yeah. a local foliation. What's uh, what does local foliation mean as opposed to just foliation? Well, uh, well, it means they have compactness. So let, let me let me say that now. Um, so local foliations just means through every point of sigma there's a holomorphic the projection of a holomorphic plane that passes through it. But now I need a way to compactify the modularized phase if I want a global foliation. Um, I, I, if I want actual planes that pass through every point as opposed to some more general object. Let me let me say well, maybe like a hygienist thing. No, like a like a building. I mean, okay, so what's happening here is that if I want my moduli space to foliate my manifold sigma, I need an a priori way of compactifying M. Okay, and there is a way to do that. Called the Gromov compactification or the SFT compactification. So you go from M and you, grow, uh, you compactify it. Gromov or SFT. No, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. Okay, let, let me just say this now and then maybe I can. Yeah. So, I mean, in principle, you know, M, every element in M is a plane, but what could happen is that it might degenerate. Into something which is not really a plane, but it's a homomorphic building. So you need to think what happens if I take a sequence of planes, UK, how can the sequence uh, degenerate? And well, sort of grammar compactness, what it tells you is that it can degenerate some object that looks, could look like this. So it's a, sort of, it breaks into a bunch of pieces. So here you just think like there's some levels. Here okay, there's a copy of the simplification. There's another copy of the simplification and another one. And each of these components is a holomorphic, uh, well, not a plane, but a holomorphic cylinder, or a holomorphic curve fence, or whatever. Um, but they glue topologically to give me a plane. So this is the sort of the type of object that you could see in the boundary of the modular space. 
there's, there's an priori way of adding more stuff yeah. to compactify the modulized phase. And what I want to show is that actually I don't have to add anything and it's already compact on the nose. No, I think what I don't understand is the connection between and being compact and with and being with foliation. I mean, uh, maybe being stupid. Okay. Think uh, R3, right? Foliated by the horizontal planes. Yeah. And the moduli that moduli space is a line. Yeah. Right? That's a foliation and a line is not compact. Yeah. So, so like the space is not compact in that. But your space is also not compact. It's compactization. Yeah. Well, but when I project it down, I have sigma. I want that the projection to sigma is a foliation. Well, okay, I also wanted that it's a foliation on the simplexation. But, uh, yeah. Maybe, we can, maybe we can explain to me later why, why yeah, that is really. Oh, so, so this is uh, U infinity, right? so this is the limit of the U case. What sort of, what happens in this case is that uh, SFT compactness tells you that wherever it breaks, you see a, a ray orbit. So, you know, if this was gamma, this is still gamma, but this is, I don't know, some other orbit, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, so gamma i's are ray orbits. And each component is also finite energy. Um, but if you've done the analysis sort of carefully, you will be able to prove that you, you will be able to um, show that such a breaking in this particular situation will not happen because of the control that you have on, on gamma. So we could, we could show that, for example, that the period of gamma i is less or equal than the period of gamma. And you know, if you've taken gamma to be minimal period, then this is, of course, a contradiction. So no breaking like this could happen. Well, actually, you could also try to, you could also, you know, if you've done the analysis carefully, you actually conclude that the condescender in this it's gamma i is less or equal than two. And this also cannot happen if you have convexity. This is sort of, uh, not happen. If we have convexity. I mean, let me just remark, sort of, hoffer bitzowski sender what, what they do is like, they prove, you know, that strict convexity of sigma implies what's called dynamical convexity. Which is by definition that the Conley-Zender index of every gamma is at least three. You know, if you're careful, then well, you can show that the condescender of this guy is less than equal than two, and then if you have convexity, it cannot happen. So, in other words, um, the moduli space is compact on the nose, it's already compact. So, you know, by the end of the day, what you show is that actually, uh, actually compact. And, well, then, because it is a one manifold, it has to be a copy of S1. Okay, you, you also need to show that it's not empty. So. Okay, so, you know, N is just the, it's the S1 family. Pages of the open book. And you know, there's also more analysis that you need to do, and then you can show that every element U and M is transverse to, to the ray vector field along the interior. Could also be like a bunch of S ones. 
It could be, but just take one of them. Just take one of them. Yeah. I still don't understand why you don't want m to be higher dimensional. Well, I mean, uh, I'm not sure. It's like the point is that you actually find a gamma with those properties. Okay, so, so yeah. Let me just finish like uh, this sort of very rough sketch of a very difficult paper uh, of uh, how you how would you find gamma? Okay. So so how to find gamma? So the point is that first you do it for an easy case, you do it for an ellipsoid. Which in this case, you know, it's like some sort of integrable situation and you can actually find gamma fairly easily and then use properties of planes in cobordisms. The picture is something like, okay, here's, here's my sort of sigma, which is given, and then I sort of choose a larger, nicer looking thing, sort of sigma prime, which is an ellipsoid, this sort of very nice contact form. So here you, you find your gamma sitting somewhere over there, and then sort of, you know, you can look at this, completion of this, this is like a simplectization of sigma prime, and then you study holomorphic planes in there, you see how they break, and then you will find an orbit in sigma just by considering the moduli spaces of planes. So here's your orbit gamma. And it's sort of, it's obtained by sort of stretching, if you want, next stretching along sigma. And gamma will satisfy all the problems that you want. I mean, I've lied in several places. Well, first of all, is that C frame came after, mm -hmm. and also SFT compactness came after. Yeah. But, uh, but what they did is some sort of you know version of all of this high, high Which level theorems. Ellipsoid sigma. So uh, the ellipsoid is sigma prime sitting outside, and sigma is the, the given hyperspace. Oh, it, this, this is sitting in R4. It's sitting in R4. How do you connect between this R4 picture and the simplexization picture? What here is the simplexization? Oh, you just, you just glue it outside. So. Yeah. Oh, in fact, you, like between sigma and sigma prime, you put the cobordism. What are you putting? Yeah. You like the, the piece of R4. Or something. Yeah. I mean, the J is here that you can sort of. You can take the integral one if you want, but it's not really good. So you, you need to homotopy. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, that's a cobordism between the, the two. And then, what do you define gamma as intersection of this with uh... It's like uh, it appears uh, by taking a sequence of planes and they break. Yeah. You see gamma. Well, gamma is the orbit. Yeah. And inside of sigma, you put the simplexization, you just put the interior. You put the interior. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, so, so that, that's the end of my sketch of hofer Wysotsky syndrome. Um, so let me sort of go back to the, to the three-body problem. So how does this sort of work tie with the three-body problem? So remember we have, uh, two parameters in the problem, so the mass ratio and the energy. So we say that this pair lies in the convexity range. If the planar problem in RP3 You need to remember that RP3 is precisely the regularized level sets of, uh, of energy in the three-body problem. So you need to add collisions at infinity. 
So the planar problem in this in RP3 can be lifted with strictly convex S3 in R4. Not in any way, but in a sort of in a specified way, it's called the levy tutor regularization. So the levy tutor regularization, I mean I'm not I'm not gonna define it for you, but it's some sort of it's another regularization scheme besides the Moser regularization process. Um, and what you should think of is it is a double cover of the Moser regularization. So let me just give you an example. The example is the Kepler problem. What you should think is that, well, we have the Kepler problem. And, you know, we've seen that the Moser regularization of the Kepler problem due to the geodesic flow when it's two which is, I mean it's the flow in RP3, the unit cotangent bundle of, of uh, sorry uh, the unit cotangent bundle of S2 is a copy of RP3. And when you do this levi chimita regularization, this gives you the hop flow in S3. And here we have a two to one cover from S through from, from S3 to RP3. And uh, well, this diagram commutes. So here, this is the integral situation. In the integral case. So here, in the, you know, the half flow in S3 is just the rate dynamics that you obtain when you take the round S3 in R4. So this is the, the, the nicest. Sort of strictly convex situation that you could have. You have the boundary of a round ball. Um, and well, the corresponding nicest flow on the, on the quotient is just a geodesic flow. But then sort of in the three-body problem, of course, when, you, when, you, when you're away from the Kepler problem, you might get uh, sort of well, very different dynamical systems. And the point is, if you still have a strictly convex S3, well, this is, uh, you, you will still have sort of some strictly convex dynamical system on RP3 on the planar problem. And you, you will hope to use Hoffer with Zotsky tender in here to obtain something on the regularized dynamics of the three body problem. Um, so, so, ordinarily, this is something in uh, RP. So, this is RP3. This is a regularized problem near the Earth or near the Moon. Can you remind me, mu and C, mu is reduced mass and C is less the Tarkovic constant, so the Hamiltonian energy. Oh, okay, I see. So, you know. The point here, what we want to do, what, how do you want to tie Hoffa Vizalski standards to the three body problem is, well, you would like to use it here and then quotient it down, get something on RP3. What you get when you do this sort of disk like global surface of section is not precisely a holomorphic open book in here, is you get a holomorphic rational open book. So the, the boundary of each plane is doubly covered. So it's not exactly an honest open book. But um, uh, so let me just mention. But you can actually get an annually, uh, so you can also get an open a holomorphic open book where the pages rather than being disks are annually, and then they project down to honest holomorphic open book in RP3 as opposed to a rational. So this was this was done by by Krinevix uh, and Salomal and Totsky. So rather than uh, doing the Hopper the Hopper Bisocci Center here, you do well annually. You actually get honest uh, 
Tak można tylko open bolt napisać. Of this abstract type. So the, the, the page is a D stars one, and the monitor means the square of the So they use the same kind of machine that Hofer Vitsovsky is in there, but it's sort of with a different rather than a plane, just an angle. And let me also mention that the sort of the convexity range has been studied by a number of people. Um, so, so here are the names are again Berto, Pedro, Zonsky, um, Albert, Schoenfelder, Van Kurt. Offer. All these people study the convexity range, and what you should think of is uh, well, the pictures that I always draw for the axis. You know, here's the mu axis. Here's mu equals zero. Here's mu equals one. So there's a special value here of minus three halves, and here's the graph of the lower energy value. It's a graph. It depends on mu. So what you should think of roughly is that the convexity range lies in the low energy range. It looks something like this. I mean, it's not really well understood, this convexity range, but in principle, it's non-determinative. And it's still being studied by people like Otto and some other people in Oxford as well. So the point is that for each parameter in this range, you will have holomorphic open books. Is, uh, even if you don't the sort of a like a two to one problem. Yeah. I mean okay, you need to you need to you need to work a bit more to, to show that you know when you project it down you still have a like there's enough symmetries in the problem that you can actually Anyway, so this is a rough sketch of how people have been trying to use holomorphic curve theory in the three-body problem, especially in the planar problem. So what I will want to do next is uh, to go beyond the planar situation and study the spatial problem and discuss uh, my results with, with Otto. Here we're going to study the spatial restricted three body problem. Now, uh, rather than you know having a dynamical system on a three manifold, we'll have to consider a five manifold. And most most of whatever I will say from now on is going to be showing work with with Otto. So remember from this approach, there are two steps. The first step is. Uh, we will want to construct the global hypersurfaces of section. Step two is once you found your global hypersurfaces of section, you will want to prove some fixed point theorem for the return. And as we stand today, so the step one, we were able to find the hypersurface of section. I will state a theorem now. We were also able to prove a fixed point theorem, but so far we cannot really, we couldn't really apply it on the on the problem that inspired it, namely on the three-body problem. So I'm going to add a step three, which is some sort of alternative approach to the Poincaré scheme of finding orbits. Which I'll denote, I'll just call uh, holomorphic dynamics. I 
Now I'll explain what I mean by this notion of holomorphic dynamics later. So let me go step by step. So step one is the following. So the theorem is, is can be stated like this. So it's you to myself and Otto. So you take any mass ratio in interval zero one. And you consider sigma c as the most irregularized level set at energy c. And this, uh, you, you look at the components near the Earth or the Moon. Right? So these are the bounded components near E or M. So the theorem is that, well, sigma C is contact type, but moreover, it is, has a very nice supporting open book decompositions, which abstractly look like this. So abstractly, they're, they're open book with page D stars two and the square of a din twist for energies below the first critical energy value. And when I cross the first critical energy value, I have a connected sum component. It can be written like this. Here, these open books are adapted to the dynamics. Let me explain a bit what's going on here. You need to recall that, that sigma c for this you know, range of energies subcritical or slightly above critical so here epsilon is sufficiently small. Or sufficiently small is such that the contact condition still holds for sigma c. So you need to recall that these level sets are uh, contact type and you know, they're smooth copies of the Unicotangent bundle of S3 with its standard contact structure. And you need to recall that um, you have the same thing, but a connected sum. for each case. These are contact types. And the point here is that, you know, these are, you know, invisible, there's just contact manifolds uh, where the sort of the geometry is fixed and it's rather simple, but the dynamics may be very complicated. Um, so on the one hand, Giroux correspondent tells you that the open books that support this contact structure, abstractly, they look like this. But what Giroux doesn't tell you is that if you give me a contact form, then I can find an open book adapted to the dynamics of the contact form. So that's precisely the content of the theorem. So the, the contact form is given 
and I adapt the open book to it rather than vice versa. So let me add some remarks is that first of all, this holds uh, very much non perturbatively so it holds for every mass ratio and for every uh, mu c uh, for every sorry, for, for every mass ratio and for every subcritical c so in the low energy range so i'm not assuming any convexity on the, on the mu c so this holds for every mu Consider one and low energy C. So no convexity assumption. And well, the binding of the open book is RP3, which is the planar problem. So the picture is something like here's RP3. It's a planar problem. And I have you know the neighborhood of the binding. I have my pages, which are copies of, of B stars two. Here's a B stars two. And so for each point in the interior of the page. You know, the Hamiltonian flow wraps around and then it comes back to the same page. So I have a return map. Which in principle is defined on the interior of the page. In fact, it is a symplectomorphism for, for a suitable symplectic one. Too. So it preserves some symplectic form, omega, where the omega depends on mu and c. It's just the derivative of alpha, which depends on mu and c, restricted to the page. And here, alpha mu c is just a contact form for the for the rate dynamics. This is spatial contact form. So it, it's restriction to the binding. It's a planar contact form. I'm a little confused about the general what's, what's going on related to the previous thing. So in, in this uh, HWZ case, you, uh, you're trying to find an open book. Yeah. You can find the modular space, and then you find an open book, and the binding of that is, um, it's a, circle. is a circle. Here, you, you're binding an RP3. So you already have an open book. You try to find something inside of one of the leads, or so. What I'm saying is that I already know that I have an invariant subset, which is RP3, which is a planar problem. In the spatial problem, um, the invariant subset is this orbit, right? This half link, um, which you have to find right, on the nodes. So if you want the the spatial problem is. To find global hypersurface of section is actually much easier than the planar problem. Because you have global coordinates and you can describe the invariant subsets by just forgetting two of those coordinates. So this much, I don't need to use any homomorphic curve theory for this theorem. Okay. So this is this is purely computational. Like it's just you sit down and do a bunch of estimates. I'll tell you a bit now about what, what the actual idea for the proof is. But um, 
whereas finding global hypertensive subsections, step one is probably it's much easier. Mm -hmm. All the other steps is, are sort of more, more complicated than the, than the planar situation. So this is like oh, a, are we doing planar now? No, we're doing spatial. And spatial, okay. Couldn't you find the for the planar one? I could. Couldn't find the find the, the either end subset and then intersect with the like locus of orbit that only stay on the plane. Uh, yeah. And that would give an invariant subset too. Right. I mean, in some sense, you, you still have invariant curves and have or orbits in here. What I want to do is find orbits which are away from the planar problem. Right? Spatial orbits, sort of, sort of purely away from the planar problem. Uh, so uh, here, I didn't say, but tau, tau is the densidal twist. This is a densidal twist. You know, okay, this twist was defined in dimension four by Arnold, and then in dimension two, it's just a classical day twist, and then sidle generalized it to any other dimension. So it's a simple ectomorphism of these stars too. And here, so one and T two are the corresponding then sidle twist on each of these copies. So here's a, the boundary connected. So. Okay, so, so let me give you sort of the rough idea of how, how you would prove this. So first of all, you know, you have QP coordinates, right? So remember that the binding of the planar problem is I drop the last two coordinates. And the Q and P coordinates are in principle global, right? So, so it's, you know, the invariant subset admits a very simple expression. So I already know that this is invariant. This is invariant under the Hamiltonian flow. So I don't, I don't need to find it. So the key idea is, well, to try to use this uh, to construct the open book explicitly, just, you know, write down some equations. So for that, I consider what we call the physical open book, just to find on a level set of the Hamiltonian away from the planar problem, taking values in the circle. What I do is just take QP and project it down to the last two coordinates. So I just Take the last two coordinates, Q3 Q and P3. I sort of um, cook up a complex number from both of them and I divide by its norm. So this is obviously defined away from the binding where the denominator is zero. Um, and what I would like to show is that, well, the, the, the Hamiltonian vector field is transverse to the fibers. And in fact, that is not a hard computation. So, you know, this is a map to S1, so it has an associated angular coordinate. So omega p, which is just a derivative of i p, which has some angular form, which you can write down as p3 dq3 minus q3 dp3, divided by the norm squared of p3 squared plus q3 squared, this yes, away from me. So, well, you can easily compute, uh, you know, you can write down the Hamilton equation, which, you know, the last three components look like this. So, 
you look at the derivative of h with respect to p3, and this is actually you compute it, and it's p3. And you consider p3 dot, which is minus the derivative of h with respect to q3. And after you've done the computation, what you'll get is minus q3 times 1 minus mu divided by the distance from q to the earth to the cube plus mu divided by the distance from q to the moon to the cubed. You just write down Hamilton's equations and this is what you get. And this means that when I plug in the Hamiltonian vector field to the angular form, you do the computation and you will get p3 squared plus q3 squared, some term which looks like this. I mean, you do some sort of easy computation, you plug in the angular form, um, you, you sort of, you plug in the Hamiltonian vector field to the angular form, you get this. And now the point is that this is strictly positive. This is strictly positive. If uh, you're away from the planar problem. All right, so if p3 squared plus q3 squared is non-zero, then the denominator is strictly positive and it vanishes precisely when p3 equals q3 equals zero. So if numerator is zero, if and only if uh, uh, p3 equals q3 equals zero. In other words, so the, the fibers of this uh, physical open book are transfers to the Hamiltonian vector field away from the binding. The problem is, is that this computation does not work on collision. If Q equals E or Q equals M, you know, this is still singular. And in fact, it cannot work along the collision locus at all. So, problem here this does not extend to the collision locus. Collision locus Q equals M or Q equals M. And it's not just you know a technical issue that you know that the competition doesn't work. It in fact cannot extend to the collision locus because of the following reason. Indeed, you could have orbits which look like this. You know, imagine that you have the Earth here and the satellite over here, and I just leave it with no velocity whatsoever. So what the satellite is going to do is going to get pulled by the Earth and it's going to crash directly with the Earth. There's a collision orbit, but because I regularized, I continue my dynamics. So this, you know, comes back and then reaches the same point and back again. So this is a periodic collision orbit. So it bounces over the Earth. So this is one of the polar orbits. The polar collision orbit. And what does this mean? Well, this is, this is V, this is P3 equals Q3 equals zero. So this is the plane, the planar situation. But 
what does this one of the pages of this open book look like? So if I consider the page E, which is just uh, Q3 equals zero, and P3 is strictly positive, which is just, just a fiber over the point um, over the point I. This is the fiber of, of, of this physical open book, which, you know, geometrically just means that I stand on the plane and I shoot up. This is the, this is the Q3, uh, P3, uh, so Q3 coordinate. Okay. So physically, a page, one of the fibers of this open book just means uh, shooting up orbits like this. If I'm away from the collision, so what will happen is that this guy will want to come back to the plane and intersect the plane transversely, and then sort of come back and do something like this. So transversality of this page to the Hamiltonian system precisely means that orbits intersect the plane transversely. But since you have one of these orbits, this orbit this obviously does not intersect the plane transversely because it's always bouncing over the Earth. So this kind of orbit prevents that uh, so this computation extends over the collision locus. So you lose transversality near the collision locus. So, you know, polar orbits prevent, prevent transversality on the collision locus. What you actually end up having to do in order to prove this theorem is that, well, once you regularize, there's another open book which actually works near the collision locus, which we call this geodesic open book. And you need to interpolate between this physical open book and the geodesic open book near the collision locus. And this creates an interpolation region in which you need to do a lot of fine estimates in order to conclude transversality and conclude that you have an adapted open book. So that's, that's the difficulty here. But in principle, it's just computational, right? It's, there's no holomorphic curve theory or anything. So in some sense, it could have done many years ago. But for us, at least, the insight came precisely from Drew correspondence, which is only 20 years old. I mean, it was very clear to me that I had to find uh, an open book realizing the abstract version of the supporting open book for the context structure. And once you know what to look for, well, uh, you just sit down and try to find it, and in this case, we found it. So this is sort of how it happened. Um, yeah, so, so this is as much as I will say about the adapted open books. Let me also state some nice, uh, some nice proposition is that there's a lot of symmetries in this problem in the symbolic problem. And we have, in particular, we have symplectic involution, which is very nicely compatible with the open book. So I consider the reflection along the equator R and in, in S3, so reflection along S2 inside S3. Okay. So this is S3, this is S2, and I just reflect along the equator. So this induces a physical symplectomorphism. Denote by little r. This is a map from T star S3 to itself, which preserves a standard symplectic form. So we can write it down as R Q P 
is R of Q differential at uh, Q of R uh, star inverse by to P. So this is an inverse map. So this is a symplectic homomorphism. The proposition is that the open book is very nicely compatible with this uh, involution. So if I consider P theta as the theta page, if I wrote over theta for the open book uh, given by the theorem that I just erased. Um, this is the theta page from sigma c then one can check that this symplectomorphism maps one page to its opposite. And its fixed point set is precisely the binding of the open book. Right, so this is, in other words, the open book is very nicely symmetric. A open book. Open book is compatible with the symmetries of the problem. Okay, so this already uh, gives us uh, the whole generalization of, of step one in the program. But let me also state another theorem due to myself and Otto, which has to do uh, with the return map. Right? So we have a return map, and the statement is that for every mu in the interval zero one, and for every subcritical sub energy then the return map extends to the boundary the boundary is RP3 to a Hamiltonian map. Hamiltonian is a F, which depends on mu and c, uh, preserving omega, which again also depends on mu and c. So here I'm saying a, a bunch of things. So first of all, you know, the fact that, that, that F is a symplectomorphism follows from the proposition that I proved at the beginning of the lecture. Okay. So here, this symplectic form is just so there's the restriction of the derivative of the contact form to the level set. So the content is that, first of all, it extends to the boundary, which is really non-trivial. So in general, it's a very delicate question whether a return map extends or not to the boundary. Um, in this particular case, well, the situation is very favorable, so we have global coordinates. Um, so one needs to check that the Hessian of the Hamiltonian restricted to the symplectic normal bundle to the binding is positive definite. 
which is something which is much easier said than done. I mean, remember that the equations get very complicated. The fact that the return map is Hamiltonian is also non-trivial and more or less depends on the geometry of the situation. So this depends on, on the fact that, first of all, uh, the page has no first cohomology, which implies that symplectic um, isotopies are the same thing as Hamiltonian isotopies. There's a second statement that uh, every return map can be joined to a representative of the monodromy by a symplectic isotopy. And there's a third statement that the monodromy of the open book in this particular case is Hamilton. So this sort of depends on a, a number of things. So H1, the page is zero. So there's no flux. So Hamiltonian isotopies are the same thing as symplectic isotopies. The uh, second condition is that the F can be joined symplectically to representative of the monodromy. Tor squared. And the third condition is that the monodromy as an isotopic class is Hamiltonian. So you combine all these three things and you get the third chain. Tor squared is Hamiltonian. Let me remark here that the Hamiltonian that generates the monodromy is not compactly supported in the interior of the page, so it is allowed to move the boundary. So what have we done so far? We have reduced um, the study of our dynamical system to the study of some very potentially very complicated return map but that we know at least that it is Hamiltonian and that it extends to the boundary. So if you were convinced from the previous lectures that the dynamical system that you obtain in the planar problem, like the return map can already be quite complicated, then the spatial return map F is probably at least as complicated as the return maps that arise in the planar situation. So this finishes like step one in the whole approach. So it's a generalization to the spatial situation of step one in Poincaré's approach. What is step two? So now step two is the fixed point theorem. And I will state the general version and then sort of specialize it But it's as follows. So first we consider a Liouville domain W omega. It's a Liouville domain. So the Liouville domain is just a symplectic manifold with an exact symplectic form such that the Liouville vector field associated to the exact symplectic form is outwards pointing. So you will vector field. So in particular, the boundary here, the boundary B is contact type. So it inherits contact form. So B is contact type. The alpha is just a restriction of lambda to the boundary. And I will consider a map, which is going to be, it's going to play the role of a return map. So I will consider a map to from W to W, a Hamiltonian map. So remember, Hamiltonian map just means that it's a time one map of a Hamiltonian flow.
So definition, I mean, we're trying to sort of follow Poincaré's steps and trying to sort of generalize his Poincaré Birkhoff theorem. So we need to come up with a with a sort of a notion of what it means to be a twist map. So I will just say that tau is a Hamiltonian twist map. If there exists a smooth, or at least C2, Hamiltonian, H sub T depends on time, find on W taking values in real numbers, such that first of all, well, it generates a map. So the Oh, it's just a time one map of the Hamiltonian flow. This is just what it means to be Hamiltonian. And the second condition, and this is a crucial condition, is that uh, the Hamiltonian vector field, I want the Hamiltonian vector field, uh, when I restrict it to the boundary, to be a positive multiple of the ray vector field at the boundary. So here, h sub t is the smooth function on the boundary. So here you should think, you know, the classical set of this uh, is the annulus. Contact manifold in dimension one is very boring. It's just a circle and the contact structure is just zero. But what's important is the ray vector field, which is just a multiple of the S1 direction. But, you know, the definition of Hamiltonian twist map just means that at the boundary, the Hamiltonian vector field runs in the positive direction of the ray flow. But because of orientations, in the case of the annulus whose boundary is disconnected, running in the positive direction of the ray flow means running in one direction on one of the components and in the opposite direction on the other one. So this twist condition recovers the classical twist condition. So at least this is a Hamiltonian version of what it means to be a twist map. And in the definition, well, you can sort of check that those two, the, the last condition is equivalent to the, to the, to the condition a, HT restricted to the boundary. It's a constant, well, constant only T dependent and that the uh, function ht is just the derivative of, of ht in the lubal direction v restricted to the boundary, which we assume to be strictly positive. So here v is just a lubal vector. So you, know, you, you can recover little ht from big ht in the lubal direction. It's also a technical condition that I will want to introduce. Which we're sort of, which we'll, we'll call index definite. Definiteness or positivity. Index definiteness or index positivity is the following. So we assume that the contact structure 
the kernel of alpha is uh, globally syntactically trivial. And I want to assume that there exists some trivialization uh, epsilon, and there exists some positive constant c and some constant d, which does not necessarily have to be positive, such that if I compute the Condizenda index of every orbit in this trivialization, then its absolute value is supralinear. So here, a greater or equal than the constant c times t plus t, where t, uh, so this is for every gamma, for every orbit gamma, and t here is the rave action of gamma. So this is a definition of index definiteness. To get index positivity, you just drop the absolute value in the definition. Okay, so this is some sort of technical condition, but the whole point that I want to make is that you should think of this as some sort of index growth condition. So if the action of the ray orbit is very large, well, then the Collisender index will also be large. And while in principle this is quite a technical condition, it is implied by a more natural condition, namely convexity. The lemma is that if sigma alpha is strictly convex hypersurface in F4, then it is index positive. Okay, so this condition, uh, you should think about it in, in terms of, well, it's some sort of convexity condition. And moreover, it also holds in sort of also natural situations, namely where you're considering um, the geodesic flow of a metric with positive curvature. So this is also related to, to Frank's theorem on, you know, geodesics on S2. You know, the, the theorem that I mentioned last time, you know, when he found infinitely many geodesics on an S2 with positive scalar curvature. So whenever you have positive scalar curvature, you also expect that the index of geodesics in the sense of calculus of variations grows with iterations. So this is a, a version of that. So the theorem, um, this is a generalized poincare Birkhoff theorem. which is due to myself and Otto, reads as follows. So we start with a Hamiltonian twist map to all. If the dimension of the Liouville domain is at least four, we need to make some further technical assumptions. So namely assume that the first turn number of W restricted to pi two of W is zero. And you assume that the boundary is index positive or index definite. And you also need to assume that the fixed points of tau are isolated.
and you need to add a third assumption, which is like the symplectic homology of the Liouville domain is infinite dimensional. Then the conclusion is that tau has periodic points. Which are interior or interior and of unbounded minimal period. Unbounded minimal period. So let me explain a bunch of stuff. So, the symplectic homology, I mean, I haven't, I haven't told you what it is and I will also not tell you. I mean, I will specialize this very general theorem to a particular case in a moment, but um, it is roughly some blur theory that keeps track of Sort of critical points in the interior of W and orbits at the boundary. And I'm asking that it's even a dimensional as a vector space. Uh, this is certainly true for cotangent bundles, in particular, the, the case of T stars too. Um, and this is also another technical uh, assumption that has to do with the gradient in symplectic homology, but it's also satisfied for cotangent bundles. And this index definite condition, we saw that it's also implied by more natural convexity assumptions. The fact that the fixed points are, told, uh, are isolated has to do with, well, how we prove it with sort of using some version of local for homology. Um, but if you don't have this, well, it's also a positive result. It means that you have, because of compactness of W, it means that you have infinitely many fixed points. Um, but you cannot really conclude that the minimal periods are unbounded. Um, and this is sort of a vast generalization of the poincare breakoff theorem to, to arbitrary dimensions. So, you know, Poincare breakoff theorem is W, it's just the case of the annulus, and, and this certainly recovers that. So, let, let me state, let me state a particular case of this, which doesn't need to talk about symplectic homology if you don't know what that is. So, yeah, this is a sort of special case. W is a tribal wise starship domain inside a cotangent bundle. So this is tribal wise star shaped. And uh, M here is orientable and closed. And we have a Hamiltonian choice map. If we assume that its boundary is index definite, and that the fixed points of tau are isolated. then the same conclusion holds. Okay, so I'm using here that the symplectic homology of a cotangent bundle or a five-wise starship domain a cotangent bundle is infinite dimensional and it falls from a theorem usually attributed to Viterbo. Like the symplectic homology of, of W is just the homology on the on the space of free loops on M, and um, C one of W is automatically zero because I'm assuming that the base is oriented. So this is a special group. So 
as I said, sort of this is a sort of a vast generalization of the Poincaré Perikoff theorem. The unfortunate situation at the moment is that um, in the case of the three body problem, which is the problem that um, inspired the theorem, uh, everything uh, is satisfied except perhaps the twist condition. So the return map in the three body problem, as I said before, it is Hamiltonian. Uh, but I do not know, we don't know whether we can find a Hamiltonian uh, generating it, satisfying the conditions and the definition of the Hamiltonian twist map, namely that it runs in the positive direction of the ray flow at the boundary. And in principle, it's not an easy condition to check, it seems. Me and Otto, we were able to write down the Hamiltonian in the sort of integrable limit case of the rotating Kepler problem. Everything is completely explicit. Um, but uh, we, write, we wrote down a generator in Hamiltonian, but unfortunately this not satisfy the twist condition according to this definition. Um, it does not mean on the nose that there's not exist another generator in Hamiltonian, which does, but uh, I mean, it's really unclear at the moment. And in principle, the difficulty is that the Hamiltonians are in principle non-autonomous and the space of generating Hamiltonians for a fixed Simple ectomorphism is sort of seems, I mean, out of reach. I, I, I mean, at least I don't know how to get my hands on it. So let me just, you know, write down what I just said roughly. So, The three body problem so we need to check the twist condition on these stars too and this seems hard One of also one of the difficulties is that the truth condition is not an open condition. Um, there is still some freedom. Uh, maybe maybe one can still change the, the definition uh, to make it more checkable. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, at the moment, this is sort of work in progress. In any case, what happens in the integrable case? the rotating Kepler problem, nu equals zero. What happens is that the geometric situation actually is very nicely compatible with the dynamics. So what, what you need to recall here is that D star is two, which is the page of the open book, is a left just vibration whose fiber is, a, is an annulus D star is one, and its monodromy is the square of a dangerous. So the picture is two singular fibers and the singularities are precisely the north and the south pole of the zero section and here are the critical values and the zero section this is S2 which is a Lagrangian zero section projects down to this interval between uh, the point minus one, one, and this is sort of the base is a copy of a plane, C. And you can check explicitly what the return map actually is. So, and what happens is that F, which is a return map on these stars too, it preserves the fibers of this less reservation. Each singularity is a fixed point and it acts as a classical integrable twist map on the annulus fibers. So this is preserves the fibers. Okay. 
where it acts as a classical twist map. In other words, sort of it rotates one binary component in one direction, the opposite in the opposite direction, similarly here. And it fixes the, the singularities. And also fixes the left singularities. So you know you need to remember that fixed points of the return map correspond to orbits. And what does the orbits corresponding to those fixed points look like in phase space? They're precisely the polar orbits. So here's the Earth. And the rotating Kepler problem, there's only one primary. Nu was the mass of the moon, so the moon is gone. Now I have the Earth here, and I have these two orbits, which are the polar orbits sitting over uh, one in the upper half plane and the other one in the lower half plane. So this is a Q3 positive, this is Q3 negative, and you have this orbit bouncing on top, this orbit bouncing below, and these are the two orbits corresponding to those critical points. And so these are uh, periodic collision orbits. And you know there, there's a very nice discussion in, in, in our paper with Otto, it's is with appendix appendix A, I think appendix A in uh, in, the, in the paper which uh, I mean, I'm particularly proud of because I think it's very pretty. <laughs> I mean, it, it's sort of, one can study this map very explicitly. It's a fairly simple map, but one can see absolutely all the qualitative picture of the situation by just looking at this such desegregation. And, you know, as I said, you can also write down this return map very explicitly, and you can write down a generating Hamiltonian. And, uh, Well, because you know we still couldn't apply our fixed point theorem in the three-body problem, uh, one can come up with the following alternative version. This is step three: holomorphic dynamics. So what do I mean by holomorphic dynamics? Well, the first observation that I want to that I want to make is that remember this is the page of an open book in S star S3, right? So D D star S2 uh, has a genus zero left observation, right? Has a left observation with genus zero fibers. Which is precisely the, the pictures that I drew. Uh, the fibers are just uh, annually. And this is the page of an open book, of, a, of the open book that we've been looking at on the Unicode tangent bundle of S3, which is just S2 times S3. And this open book supports the context structure. Uh, supporting the standard context structure on this manifold. Um, so I, I will want to say that this manifold as a contact manifold is an iterated planar bifold. 
I e SRS3 with the standard contact structure is an IP fivefold. Let's read it later. IP fivefold. So. It's also this is a structural observation, which we've already used in some sense. And what happens if I look at the moduli space of fibers? So, What is it? So let, let me just, first of all, write, write it like this. So S2 times S3, as, as, we, as we just saw, is open book. D stars 2 with monogamy square of the then final twist. It's, it's, a, it, it's page, D stars 2 is this left reservation. D stars 1, and I denote it by tall P. E. So this is the two dimensional plane twist. As opposed to the four dimensional data so P for planar. Um, and the, the binding of this open book, this RP3, is well, the boundary of a page. So I replace LF for OB. This is the iterative planar picture. But what happens if the moduli space of fibers, what you should think of is I have this picture on each page on these stars too. But I have an S1 family of such pages. And when I forget about the fibers, what I see is a two disk worth of fibers. But this two disk, I need to move it around with the S1. Each page has the same boundary though. It's the S1 boundary corresponding to the S1 family of pages of the open book in RP3. So what do I see? I first when I project down to the moduli space of fibers, I see an S1, which is the S1 family of pages in RP3. And now for each of the pages D stars 2, I have a two disk. So a point in the space is just an annulus. Or I could also have two singular versions. Now I have a, a singular annulus in here. But then for each page, I need to move it around. But like each such left iteration induces the same open book in the binding of the open book in S2 times S3. So I have a family of disks. And a point in, in a disk is again an annulus. And Basically, these two singular fibers, as I move them around, they trace out, uh, these two critical values trace out two family of loops. Which you just think of as something like this. So I have this two circles, you know, they close up, and a point in one of those circles is a singular annulus, so it's a, a nodal curve. So this is nothing else than an open book for S3. So the moduli space M is a copy of S3 with its trivial open book. Again, each point in this S3 corresponds to a fiber of the left reservation for the iterated planar structure on S2 times S3. Okay, so this is sort of the, sort of the underlying geometry. And now I will state a the theorem, and the whole point of the theorem is in some sense, it starts with a holomorphic open book in RP3, and 
upgraded to a foliation of S2 times S3, which looks precisely like this on each page. So assume that RP3 has a, an adapted holomorphic open book. Adapted holomorphic open book. AG when you are in the convexity range. By result of uh, Umberto Rinevich and sort of Salomao and Vitotsky that I already mentioned. So if you assume such a thing, the following theorem, what it does is that it takes that moduli space, this S1 family of pages, and it sort of induces a foliation, uh, which extends the foliation in RP3 to a foliation of S2 times S3. So in other words, you start with this S1 family of pages, you obtain the other foliation in, in S2 times S3. So the theorem, this is a, a paper, which is a spin-off of the work with Otto, which I put out on the archive at, at the same time. So, the moduli space M, uh, well, it's a copy of S3. And it inherits, it's actually an S3, but it's much more than an S3. It's in fact a contact S3. This inherits a, a contact form. From alpha say contact form alpha inherits a contact form alpha sub curly m from alpha whose ray dynamics is adapted to the trivial open book. And because, well, of Drew correspondence, its kernel is necessarily isotopic to the standard contact structure on S3. So the picture that you should think of is uh, the idea. It's uh, here's and the same picture that I drew before, only higher dimensional. So here's the binding V, which is RP3. Here's R times RP3, or R times B. Here's the R direction of the specification. Here's the unit contention bundle of S3. S3 times S2. And what we see is a foliation of the symplectization of this guy whose leaves are mutable completions of the page, so T star S2, which project down to a D star S2, which is the page of the open book in here. And so I start by assuming that there's a holomorphic, there's a modulized space of holomorphic curves in here, which is a circle. And I upgrade it to a foliation of this picture. You know, I have a bunch of holomorphic curves now. And one of the gains from Seifring intersection theory in higher dimensions in this case is that holomorphic curves need to lie in this co dimension two leaves. And then I can just use some results by Chris Wendell, uh, which give me this very nice sort of foliation by left observations on each page. So that's how I obtain this very nice foliation. So, in other words, sort of C frame tells me that 
Well, first of all, I have a foliation on R times B. And I upgrade this to a, to a foliation. This is the upgrade to a foliation on R times S star S3. So here I'm using that C frame that curves lie in core dimension two. leaves uh, T star S2. And then I can use Wendell to prove the result. So this is a very rough sketch. So this is how you get the left information structure. And let me sort of tell you how you construct the symplectic form on, well, so first of all, I have a modulized space living in the symplectization. When I project it down, I have my foliation. So let me just denote m hat by the modulized space of curves on the symplectization, which is just r times the modulized space of curves in the projected manifold. So this is you know, an element here is just a, uh, a copy of a, of a cylinder. The symplectic form is similar as to what Hofer does. So you take the uh, diffeomorphism from, zero, uh, from R to zero one, you twist the symplectic form on the symplectization What I want to do is sort of a more or less tautological construction. So I have a holomorphic curve in there. It's a holomorphic cylinder. And I want to define a symplectic form on this moduli space, which will depend on the nodes, it will depend on phi. So I sit on a point in here, which is a map. And I take two tangent vectors to that map, which is to think of as vector fields along u. And what I will do is I will simply take these two vector fields along the curve. I will pair them up with a symplectic form, and I will integrate that pairing against the restriction of the symplectic form to the image of u, which is an area form on u. In other words, so I, I will take omega phi, I will in, integrate the pairing over u against the area form given by the restriction of the symplectic form uh, omega phi to u itself. So this is an area form on the domain of u. I, I need to pull back everything, right? But holomorphic curves in particular are symplectic surfaces inside the symplectization. So when I restrict the symplectic form to their images, that's an area form on the domains. So I integrate uh, sort of the, the pairing of the symplectic of the of the two vector fields against that area form. And this is what defines me the two form in here. So here, V W are vector fields along U. Okay, I mean, there's a, there's a few things that you need to show. Well, that there is a symplectic form. And the fact that it's a symplectic form counts because I understand precisely what the structure of the moduli space is. Oh, 
on the nose, this depends on my choice of fee, but uh, the, the choice the, the contact form will actually not depend on the fee. So the contact form on M is, well, you take the symplectic form, well, the, this is supposed to be the symplectization of the contact form. So how do you obtain the contact form from the symplectization form? Well, you just, you just contract alpha M is just the one over e to the phi prime times the contraction of this symplectic form omega which depends on phi. So partial T is just the R direction, which this this R direction in the modulus. So here I'm using that translating a holomorphic curve gives me another holomorphic curve. So this is a contact form and it's phi independent because I'm sort of, this is the, this is the dependence of, of each of the derivative of phi is, the derivative of each of the phi is precisely um, the dependence of, of the symplectic form on, on phi. In other words, omega m phi is just the derivative of e to the dt alpha. Okay, so I mean, what's the takeaway here? What's the gain? I put a lot of geometric structures on the moduli space of holomorphic curves. In particular, I put a contact form, so I have an associated dynamics. I have a great dynamics of that contact form. And you should know that the construction of alpha m depends on, 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 on the choice of symplectic form, and the symplectic form depends on the given contact form on S star S3. What's a holomorphic shadow? Well, alpha, and this is by definition, uh, well, of, or let's say of the ray dynamics of alpha. It's the ray dynamics of alpha m on the moduli space. Should think of here is uh, I've taken my rate dynamics originally adapted to an open book in S2 times S3. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm projecting it down to some moduli space. So what's going on is the following. So if you call L the binding in RP3, you should think of in terms of the three body problem as the unit of the direct and sort of retrograde orbits. There's a semi conjugation map. So I look at S2 times S3 minus this link L, the hot link. I have um, my original dynamics sort of lives in the space, but I project it, project it down. I modify it in such a way that now the new dynamics maps holomorphic curves to holomorphic curves. So I get a flow here, Vt, which is not the original flow on the nose. And I have a projection map to the moduli space M, which is a copy of S3. And in here, I've got the shadow. So this is the shadow rate dynamics on the moduli space. And here, uh, Vt is obtained From the original flow, from the from the alpha flow, by a projection. So it's obtained by you take 
the alpha flow of the original ray vector field restricted to u, and you project it down by a L2 projection. So this is an L2 orthogonal projection. So here, with respect to the metric E alpha J dot, so this is a metric, right? So I have an associated L2 orthogonal projections of sections normal to U. Let's say on, on W12, this is a Hilbert space of sections of vector fields normal to U. So I project it down to the span of some vector fields E1, E2, E3, which is the tangent space of the moduli space. These are vector fields along U. Um, and here you should think of like, this is precisely the kernel of the linearized, the normal linearized cauchy riemann operator along U. So I just L2 projected. So now I have a vector which is tangent to the moduli space, so it gives me a flow in the moduli space. So you know, Pt maps holomorphic annually to a holomorphic annually. So in particular, it gives me this semi-conjugation here. So if I project down to the, to the lead space, I can see it as a flow on the quotient. So, I mean, the bad thing about this construction is that it alters the dynamical system, so you need to project it down. In some sense, this phi t, this flow, is the flow which is closest to the original one and has with the property that it preserves the foliation, that it maps a holomorphic annulus to another holomorphic annulus. So it's the best representative of the original ray flow with that property. So, as I said, this alters the dynamics because now the new flow maps homomorphic annually to homomorphic annually. Well, I mean, the original one might not necessarily have this property, but what happens is that if I project the ray flow. This doesn't change anything in the integrable case. So from mu equals zero in the, in the three body problem, or you know, from mu equals zero or c equals minus infinity, the projection leaves the original rate dynamics fixed precisely because, as I mentioned before, in the rotating Kepler problem, the dynamical system fixes the fibers of the left -right vibration. So I can already on the nose see it as a flow on S3. It just projects down to the hot flow so, because it maps each fiber to itself. So I just project it down and I only recover the hot flow. This projection is uh, the hot flow on S3. So you might ask, oh, well, it might be the case that you always recover the hot flow. So this construction is kind of stupid. But that's not the case as the following theorem shows. So I look at, I will define the space grave of D stars two well squared by definition, this is just a space of contact forms, alpha that is are adapted to, the, to a concrete version of the open book, which has to be fixed. But I'll just you know, say too much about that. So there's a, there's a fixed concrete open book of this subject type to which alpha is adapted and also alpha adapted to the binding RP3. Uh, sorry, alpha restricted to the binding RP3 is also adapted to the open book G stars one for P squared. So 
in some sense, this is uh, iteratively adapted. And I have a holomorphic shadow map, which takes an element which is nicely adapted in this sense. And it gives me a flow adapted on S3 to the trivial open book. I mean, by definition, this is sort of the same thing, but well, the second condition is not there anymore. So it maps alpha to the contact form on the moduli space. And the theorem is that HS is subjective. So what does this mean? It means that you give me any great dynamics adapted to the trivial open book in S3, and I can lift it to a rate dynamics iteratively adapted on S2 times S3 to the given open book. So in other words, you're not always recovering the whole flow. You actually recover everything. IE can always lift the rate dynamics on S3. And here I will call the fiber of the hope flow interval fiber. Here we in here we have the rotating temporal problem. Well, the picture is something like this. So you should think we have you know the three-body problem, and here we've got H of L1. So everything below H of L1 is low energy. So somewhere in here we've got the convexity range. And using this theorem by Hinevix and, and, and people, this gives you an adapted, an adapted holomorphic open book on RP3. So it gives me every, every sort of dynamical system here gives me a adapted uh, rate flow in this space. And I just project it down using the holomorphic shadow to the space of rainfall is adapted to the trivial open book on S3. In here, somewhere in here, I have the hot flow. And here is mu equals zero, which is a rotating Kepler problem. And this projects over to the hot flow. You know, and other contact forms up here giving me the rate dynamics for the three body problem in low energy in the convexity range give me different contact forms in S3. So the hope of this whole sort of holomorphic curve approach is I know stuff about rate flows on S3. In particular, I know that generically they have positive topological entropy. I mean, I know things about uh, when orbits uh, are the binding of open books and so on. So the idea would be to take um, I mean, to take the image in here, try to say something about the image and then try to pull it back, right? So I want to study the given dynamical system here in a five manifold via its shadow on a three manifold. So this is sort of the whole, the whole program, if you want. And so this is objective, right? So you should think of it as some sort of vibration. In fact, the fibers are contractible, everything is contractible. This is like some sort of stir vibration. So let me give you 
a further idea how, how one might play with the sort of situation that we have here. Which is the idea of a symplectic tomography. What is the symplectic tomography? So, so here's a picture, right? Here's D stars two, and I have L here, which is uh, the binding of the open book in RP three. So RP three is at the boundary. So D stars two has a lattice variation, which I'll draw like an algebraic geometer. So there are two singular fibers, saying this is a singular fiber, this is another one. Um, and I have a return map in here. So I have, a, I have some simple ecomorphism of this space. So I have F, which is a return map, giving me the dynamical system on S2 times S3. So remember, this is a page in, in the ambient fivefold. But the return map, well, because L is one circle, the retrograde, and so here's the, let's say this is the direct, and this is the retrograde. So L is fixed under the return map, but the leaves of this sort of lattice observation might not be. So in principle, they, you know, they get mapped to something else. They, they still give me a, a symplectic foliation because the map is a, is a is a symplectomorphism. So yeah, there's potentially some singular fiber here, another one here. So what I do, I I can quotient this down to the moduli space of curves, which you should think is something like this. So here's my moduli space. And if I fix a section of this lesser fibration, this is a symplectic two disk. Which is what I will call my symplectic tomography. It's like you should think of it as a tomograph. You know, this is a, I am taking different sections of my left iteration, so this is, works like a like a tomograph. So what I do, I have this is this the quotient of this left iteration is a two disk here inside S three. This is a page of the trivial open book. So here's the binding. Which is a copy of S1. So I have an associated map once I pick a, a symplectic tomography. The symplectic tomography gets mapped under F to some other sort of disk, which is symplectic, but it in principle might look weird. But this induces a map on the quotient F sub D. So this map is the point. You take a point in the two, you lift it to a point, to a unique point in the section, you map it with D to somewhere else, and you project back. So it makes this diagram commute. In principle, if F is you know, away from the integrable case, so in the integrable case, because F preserves fibers. This map in, in, in the quotient is just the identity. But this disk looks very nice. It's like it intersects its fiber precisely once, and it, it, it cannot do crazy things like, uh, like if this is the the foliation in the left in the left formation, it cannot do things like this. So this is you know this can only happen. away from the integral case. So it's actually you know, nice and it intersects the original foliation uh, precisely at one point. So if I'm not close, if I'm sort of sufficiently close to the integral case, then this map actually is an area preserving homeomorphism of the two disk. So 
if, you know, if f is close to a, to a fiber-wise preserving map, then, you know, like this is the integrable case, say, g mu equals zero, then fd still preserves area. And here I'm using that f is a symplectomorphism, so the image of d, f of d under f is again a symplectic disk with the same area as d. As d. Area of f d is the same thing as area of d. So I can just hit it with Brouwer translation theorem. So there's an interior, interior fixed point of FD. Like what's, a, what's a fixed point of D? It's just a map, or, sorry, it's a point in the original manifold whose image under the original map F lies in the same fiber containing the original point. I.e., there exists a point X in the interior of D star is two, such that F of X lies in the fiber over X. I.e., a version of a leafwise intersection. So leafwise intersection was, you know, it's a notion defined by Moser, but for a different situation where you have a, the, the foliation by isotropics of a, of a co-isotropic. So this is some sort of symplectic version where my foliation is by symplectic leaves. Um, but in some sense, you know, this is not a fantastic, uh, strong statement to make, but what the, the point I'm trying to make, there's in, sufficient enough structure on the picture that you can start playing around with things that you know in the quotient and trying to lift them up to a situation, to the original situation. And, you know, this is for a fixed D. If you, if you vary the tomography, you know, you, you start to, uh, you put your machine and sort of you move this around, so you will get infinitely many of these. So you vary the, you get infinitely many such points. Let me finish this, this whole lecture series with a, another idea. So this whole thing, you know, this whole construction induces a flow on the quotient. I might choose not to do that and just follow an orbit in the five manifold and keep track of all the holomorphic curves intersected by that, uh, by that uh, orbit. So this is the notion of the transverse shadow. So, I want to look at gamma of p, which is just the projection to the moduli space of the ray border through p. So this is a curve, this is a path in, S, in S3, which is transverse to the contact structure. It's just, you know, you remember which holomorphic curves are intersected by the ray orbit through P. So what this looks like, you know, you could imagine like, here's the, op here's the open book on S3, so here's the binding S1, and here's the page D2. And what this path looks like, it sort of wraps around the binding, but it could also self-intersect 
but it always comes back to the same page. We could self self intersect because you know this corresponds to the orbit in the original manifold coming back to the same holomorphic fiber that contains that contains it. I mean, a given orbit could intersect the same fiber multiple times. So you see this self intersections down in S three. Um, so this is in principle not good. I mean, this means that these are not precisely the the orbits of an autonomous flow. But on the other hand. This self intersections remember something about the original dynamics. So this transverse shadow, the transverse shadow, which is just a collection of all gamma p's with p in the interior of p of, of the page. This is a transverse shadow. Remembers much more about the original dynamics than the holomorphic shadow. The bad thing is that it's not a flow. So, I mean, my, my hope would be to try to, and there's a new game to play with this sort of pass. Uh, you might hope to try to understand the structure of these objects in, in, in a sufficient, sufficient, sufficient way to be able to extract information about the original dynamic system. Anyway, so, so, so let me sort of, this is the last thing that I want to say. So let me just conclude this sort of lectures with, with the sort of, let me just tell you what we've done. So, you know, We've went through the story of the whole planar um, three-body problem, how Poincaré was trying to find orbits. You know, we've reduced his approach to two, two steps, find global surface of section, try to prove a fixed point theorem. Uh, I mean, that's the most basic thing that you can hope to do, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of work that has been going on in the, in the planar case of the three-body problem. So what we've done here is we've taken the spatial situation in which now we're working on a higher dimensional dynamical system, namely in dimension five. And we have found some sort of structural underlying geometric structure. Uh, and we have found global hypersurfaces of section reducing the original five, five dimensional dynamics to a four dimensional dynamics to a map on these stars too. So that's a four manifold. And now we're trying to say something about the return map and try to uh, say something about the original dynamical system. Uh, so we proved a fixed point theorem. Unfortunately, we weren't able to check it yet on the problem that originated it. And well, you can see all, all of this holomorphic structure in the picture as well. Uh, and so one could hope to, to actually leverage knowledge from a uh, dynamical system on S3 uh, to knowledge on the, on the original five. So anyways, I'm, I'm gonna finish uh, with this conclusion. So thanks everyone for, for listening. And thanks everyone for keeping and following this lecture notes and lecture series. I will post the lecture notes very soon on the archive uh, for you to read.